tanks rumble through the streets of Tunisia, trying to impose order after weeks of turmoil. With the country's political future hanging in the balance, the role of the army will prove critical. So what part will the military play in the so-called Jasmine Revolution? This is Inside Story. Hello there, warm welcome to the programme. I'm Shuli Ghosh. So after days of rioting, Tunisia's interim leadership says the security situation is now improving. But with President Ben Ali gone, there's a power vacuum and many are wondering what comes next. Tunisia's parliamentary speaker, Fouad Mabaza, was sworn in as interim president on Saturday. He's promised elections within 60 days. In the meantime, troops are out on the streets to restore order after violence and looting. But as the political uncertainty continues, many Tunisians are wondering what the army's role will now be. A key moment during the weeks of protests came earlier this week when the army's chief of staff was said to have refused a presidential order to open fire on unarmed protesters. But does that necessarily mean the army will tolerate political change? Well, that's just one of the questions facing my guests today. In Tunisia's capital, Tunis, Amin Ghali, Programme Director for the Kawakibi Democracy Transition Centre. In London, Jeremy Keenan, North Africa security expert and author of several books on the Maghreb region. And here in Doha, Blake Housel, managing editor of Foreign Policy magazine. Gentlemen, welcome to the programme. Uh, Amin, let me start with you. Um, can you give us an update of what's happening on the streets? Is the army in control? Hello. Uh, yes, the, we can see a lot of uh, armoured vehicles in the streets, in main uh, crossroads, in front of main buildings. But the, the army is not in let's say ensuring the street to street security they have hard time doing so but people are very very confident uh, about the role of the army they see it as a uh, they see the, the whole army as their ally in these kind of hard time in this time of security issues so confidence is, uh, confidence was built during the 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 days of uh, of uh, turmoil and now the confidence is being built even further people are trusting the army with the security uh, with their security uh, concern uh, i mean is there uh, some kind of power struggle going on between the military and the security forces because we're hearing that troops are arresting some security officers and there's some speculation that, that the head of presidential security has been arrested Yes, uh, it's important to have a little background on the, about the situation here in Tunis. The army has never been playing a role in any kind of security issues inside the country. For the past two or three decades, the army has been kept in their buildings. The, uh, the security of the country has been the concern of the sec security apparatus, the huge security apparatus. So now with the overthrow of the, of the president, uh, this decision makers had to put aside the whole secure the traditional security apparatus we had uh, in in the country and somehow replace it with the military to install uh, reinstall order to install confidence in the institutions of the uh, of the of the country and uh, one of these institutions is the army people do not trust anymore the security the regular security apparatus the police the the main factions of the police so somehow they had to be put aside and replaced with the military now but, but I mean, can i can i ask struggle. you sorry to interrupt Some i mean i, I wanted to ask you why do you say that the people trust the army when president ben ali himself was an army man and when he took power uh, he had the support of the army and he kept the army under tight control. Exactly. President Ben Ali, former President Ben Ali, uh, came from a security, uh, I mean, a military background. But then when he seized power and the last two years or three years of his uh, ministerial positions, he kind of switched sides. He moved to the police uh, institution and his big ally or his big uh, arm into the country has been the security and the police forces. The, the military has been kept aside and, uh, and they didn't intervene any, in any day-to-day -day, uh, business in the country. So 
there was this kind of power struggle before the two or three decades, with the winning side being the police and the army being kept inside their casern. Now it's the other way around. Uh, the police and the security force has been asked to, to remain on the side, and the military has gone to the street and with the huge uh, confidence and with the huge trust that people have in, in this institution, they have been able to help rightfully installing the order in, uh, in the country these days. OK, let me bring Blake in here. Um, Blake, I mean, is saying that, that people there uh, trust the army. But what will the army be hoping for? Because they won't necessarily want huge political upheaval, will they? No, I mean, it looks like the army is doing everything it can to restore calm, restore order. Uh, you know, in similar situations in, in other Arab countries, um, <laughs> there aren't very many of them, but uh, in similar situations, the armies have acted to protect their own institutional and parochial interests. Um, the good news about Tunisia is that the army has been, as Amin said, you know, relatively outside of politics. They haven't you know, put their tentacles into the economy the way militaries in Egypt and Algeria have. So uh, I'm hopeful that the army will be a positive force in ensuring that uh, the elections will go forward as promised. I mean, is there any chance that we're going to see a new era of, of democracy, or that these elections will be free and fair? Well, you know, they only have 60 days uh, to pull off the presidential election, so that's not very much time at all. And in fact, uh, as I understand it, the parliament gets to choose who's allowed to run. Um, we heard today that uh, Rashid Ghanoushi, who is the head of one of the uh, Islamist parties that was banned, um, is coming back to the country. But as I understand it, he won't be allowed to compete. Um, so there's going to be some discussion about uh, the rules of the game, I imagine. And I hope that the outside countries are putting pressure on the Tunisian government, or what's left of the Tunisian government, to make sure that uh, it's doing everything it can to have a real free and fair contest. Jeremy, when we think of our Arab regimes, we often think of them as being propped up, as being supported by the army. What do you think is happening here in Tunisia? Well, I think as the two, two former speakers have just said, I think they've put, both put their respective fingers on it very well. Uh, I think the army, uh, uh, it's an opportunity for the army, in a sense, to play a very significant role uh, in the future, in a positive future. Uh, for Tunisia. Uh, as Amin has said, the, the President Ben Ali uh, more has switched to the security forces and we're seeing, uh, or it appears we're seeing uh, some of impact of that on the streets at the moment. Um, but as Meg said, the rules of the game uh, aren't at all clear yet. And this is where I think uh, we have to watch very carefully what happens in the next 60 days. 60 days is a very short time to organize an election. Um, you know, Niger has had the best part of a year to organize it. Uh, that's another country, Niger. And they've had great difficulty in just getting the, 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 the physicality of it ordered. Uh, here, when we don't even have the rules of the game at all clear, um, you know, a lot of things could happen in the next 60 days. And uh, we need to watch that, uh, you know, to, to extent, uh, you know, what, what outside countries, what what pressure they may be able to bring to bear on the determining these rules of the games and what outside countries are we talking about if we're talking about neighboring states uh, that's a different matter altogether I think both Algeria and Libya are, are, would be extremely worried uh, to see uh, too much uh, sort of democracy really coming to the fore here particularly if there's an Islamist element to it on the other hand uh, uh, the Western powers uh, don't have a huge amount of leverage in, 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 in Tunisia Europe to some extent uh, it has uh, been a strong player in the economy, and the economy has got very weak uh, recently. Um, so there are an awful lot of unknowns here, and we have to watch this space very carefully. I think, you know, uh, there are many potential scenarios uh, uh, which it's difficult to uh, really theorize about or even, you know... Uh, well, I mean, what, one of the things people are theorizing about is what happens if uh, people take uh, go back onto the streets because, I don't know, maybe they perceive the elections as being uh, not free and fair. But if the unrest happens again, there is, there is a, a sort of a, an easy piece at the moment, but if unrest happens again, what will the army do then? Will it wade in? This is an unknown question, I think. Uh, it hasn't been tested before like this. And um, uh, there is a sense that the army, you know, represents the state, the people. It is an institution of the people, but, but is it? I mean, this is, this is really untested territory. Uh, one has to remember this is the first time in the Arab world that an Arab uh, leader has been thrown out by uh, popular demonstration. I mean, this really is, 
um, I mean, that is the first time in any Arab country. So there are a lot of unique elements uh, going on here. Um, it would be difficult to tell. Uh, my gut feeling is that the army would tend to sort of step in if it felt that the rules of the game were, were not being made in any way uh, even reasonably democratic. On the other hand, if there was a large upsurgence in Islamist expression, which I think is unlikely, uh, then the army might be uh, minded to, you know, to, to, to move possibly in a slightly different direction. Uh, at the moment, and it's far too early to tell, the signs are that the army is playing a responsible role, but that has been roughly 24 hours. I mean, it's, it's far too early to tell. There's 59 days to Indeed. go and maybe longer. OK, well, as, as Jeremy was saying there, Friday's events mark the first time that popular protests have led to the fall of an Arab leader. So various autocratic regimes are now looking rather uneasily at their neighbour. In reality, though, democratic reform across the Middle East and North Africa would be difficult because of the armies. In Egypt, the authoritarian rule of Hosni Mubarak is protected by the military. In Algeria, the military has cracked down on past demonstrations. In 1988, hundreds were killed when army commanders imposed a state of siege. Morocco's military has also had a bloody record with protesters. Between the late 50s and early 90s, the Moroccan army crushed several popular uprisings. And in Libya, the leader Gaddafi is a military colonel, of course, and has his country under tight control. Uh, Blake, let me bring you in here. I mean, some observers say military rule is historically the, the norm um, in the Middle East, and that does seem to be the case in countries like Algeria and I Egypt. Right, well, exactly. But what these countries like to do is they, they like to have a democratic facade and that uh, that's useful to them the military can remain in the background and then whenever there's popular anger whenever the food prices go up or bread is scarce or jobs are scarce uh, all of that energy all of that anger gets directed at uh, the president or the parliament and that allows the military to play uh, a role behind the scenes without seen, uh, being seen as getting its hands dirty. So that dirty. they're pulling the strings without having to deal with the day-to-day -day problems of governance, in other exactly, words. Exactly, exactly. And, uh, I mean, does the military have power because civilian institutions are so weak? Well, um, in, in Tunisia, you mean? Or uh, I mean, in, when we look at various uh, Arab regimes, I mean, for example, like Algeria. Well, uh, the, in Algeria, you know, the military is really uh, built itself as the savior of the nation, the, the kind of a revolutionary military that, you know, took uh, power from the French uh, in 1962. And, and it's a unique case because uh, the Algerian military has always presented itself as the, the saviors of the Algerian nation. Um, and uh, you saw uh, in the late 80s and early 90s when there was this uh, civil war really between the army and the Islamists um, that the Algerian military had no problem using force to protect what it saw as uh, its core interests and the interests of the country, which I think the Algerian military sees as one. I mean, in Tunisia, do you see parallels between Tunisia and what's been happening in countries like Algeria, like Morocco. Do you think those countries are now looking to see what happens in Tunisia? Uh, to tell you the truth, we think that even though we have a lot of similarities between uh, the countries of the region, but each country has its own uh, background, its own uh, history. As uh, you've been saying, uh, as well as uh, guests you have, Tunisia has not had a military regime that is playing a big role. Algeria has, Libya has, uh, Egypt has the same thing. So the situation is different in, in terms of security apparatus, in, te in terms of powers, uh, power divide in the country. So this is something that is different from, other, uh, from each country to the other. The thing that is similar to all of our countries, to, to all of the countries of our region, is the lack of democracy. Uh, powers are being uh, power is being held by undemocratic forces in at a certain level I mean it depends on each country so now when they see what happens in Tunis they see as an example where people stood up and changed matters uh, people in other countries may may see this this uh, these events of Tunis as a model to follow 
as a model at least to be inspired from maybe not the same exact dynamics but things could evolve in a, in a direction that uh, could be seen as a domino effect started or initi initiated by, uh, by Tunisia, but, but by in, Tunisian in the, people. In actually. the situation in Tunisia, our other guests have pointed out that elections are going to be, hold, uh, going to be held very, very soon. And it's a very short space of time in order to organize uh, elections. So what do you think will happen? Yes, that's true. Elections are due to, to be held in, uh, within 60 days, according to provisions of the Constitution. But it's feasible. Co elections are very important to install confidence into what's happening now. We, we saw this, this change happening as a, as a people uprise, as a people will. Now we, s we need to see the follow-up of the politics. Politicians and democracy movement people need to follow what's, what happened in Tunis with the rightful and institutional changes. One of these big institutional changes is the election. I mean, elections are very important here to install the confidence and to, ha to, to help continue this process, move it from popular to somehow uh, institutionalized and people would gain the needed confidence and the, the, the trust th uh, with the, the, their institution, the trust that has been lost for the past maybe 50 years. People have not been trusting their institutions for the past, uh, I mean from independence maybe, from independence till now, 50 or 55, 54 years, people have not been trusting their institutions. Election is one of the main uh, one of the main issues that need to be addressed rightfully, even in, a, in such a short period. Okay. Um, Jeremy, Je Amin was making the point there that the, the, the role of the army in Tunisia is, is, is different to the role of the army in other countries. I mean, when we look at Egypt, for example, um, there's no doubt that the, 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 the military uh, is kingmaker and is, uh, has been propping up the regime of, of, of Hosni Mubarak. Uh, although uh, there were protests in 2008 when it looked as though the regime was wobbling but nothing happened yes i think if we take north africa as a whole the two the two big countries the two big question marks uh in every sense uh, population wise and particularly the military are egypt and algeria uh, these are the two countries that really need to be watched in a sense they're they're they're, they're the big players uh, Egypt, in terms of its uh, armed forces, I mean, we're, we're dealing with over a million people. Uh, that is, with paramilitaries and, and reservists and so forth. So there's a huge potential of, 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 of people under arm. So what the army does there is, 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 is fairly crucial. Will it continue to support Mubarak, particularly in the present times? Uh, admittedly, in Egypt, there probably are, as one analyst said the other day, there are a few more safety valves in Egypt in the political system, but they're not very big safety valves. Uh, and if the situation uh, does spread uh, following the Tunisian example, I think uh, Egypt is, 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 is a big unknown factor in a sense. Well, uh, and Egypt has got the other... Is... Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to look at uh, Egypt um, a, a, a bit more because uh, what's interesting is that Hosni Mubarak is touting his son, Gamal, as possibly the next president. And Gamal, of course, is not uh, a military man. So a lot of questions are being asked about whether the military uh, will allow that. Well, this is a question that's been asked for some time, and it's going to be asked even more now when we have this uh, tendency of, of, of right across the entire uh, North African region for the, uh, prior to the events in Tunisia, for the, the rulers to appear uh, to be creating sort of family dynasties. The dynastic element uh, is, is, is appearing uh, to be, uh, you know, strong in Egypt with, with uh, Mubarak and his son. Uh, in uh, Libya, the question is being asked there. Uh, well, Tunisia has changed. Uh, this question was also being asked in, in Algeria with Bouteflika's younger brother. Things have changed a bit there as well. And of course, then we have a, uh, a monarchy in, 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 in Morocco. So this sort of dynastic element is there. And I think what it, the message that's coming out of Tunisia, as has been coming out of all these countries, but it's difficult to come out because of the repression and the lack of freedom of speech and expression, is that, that people want uh, greater freedom to choose. Uh, they are not necessarily inclined towards this dynastic sort of situation. And I think this is particularly the case in Egypt. So I think Egypt is, some, is, is, is the one country that Egypt and Algeria are the two countries that really have to be watched very, very closely 
in the next few days and weeks for any signs of chains and shifts here, uh, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the army and particularly vis-a-vis -vis the sort of question that you've uh, just posed? Yeah, one, one interesting thing about the uh, Egyptian army was that last month a classified cable revealed by WikiLeaks exposed how the civilian regime was trying to ensure military support for the presidential succession. U.S. Ambassador Margaret Scobie wrote, the military operates a large network of businesses as it becomes a quasi-commercial enterprise itself. The regime, the, sorry, the regime may well be trying to co-opt the military through patronage into accepting Gamal's path. Um, Blake, uh, this is um, this is an interesting strategy. Uh, getting the army um, making lots and lots of money out of the private sector. In fact, some uh, some analysts are saying it controls around 30 to 45 percent of the economy. That's a good way of keeping the uh, the army on side. Exactly, and I think we, Ambassador Scobie said May. I don't think there's really any question that the Egyptian government is doing all it can to keep the the military happy. Um, and that's why if you if you read those cables you see that the military is asking for more equipment and uh, support from the United States and uh, you know that's one of the things that, that keeps militaries happy they like their toys um, but uh, in the Egyptian case uh, the privatization that has gone on over the last few decades the biggest beneficiary probably has been uh, you know retired officers uh, the military has an enormous system of patronage they Officers get discounts on housing. They get discounts at the you know special grocery stores. They have uh, all sorts of privileges. And uh, one thing that was interesting about what happened in Tunisia is the military didn't seem like it was pretty happy with the way it had been treated by President Ben Ali. So I think one lesson that Hosni Mubarak will take from that episode is make sure that I keep uh, my officers on side. Keep them sweet, yes. Um, Jeremy, you, you, you said that uh, Algeria is the other place to watch. Um, it's interesting that in the most recent protests, the Algerian army didn't crack down on protesters as they had done before. Why was that, do you think? Uh, well, I was going to say there's a point to be made here, and that is when we talk about Algeria and the military, we need to distinguish between the security forces and the army. Uh, the army, as, as you quite rightly said, uh, you know, stayed in base, uh, so to speak, during the, the, the events of last week. Um, but the security forces, that is the gendarmerie, 150-odd uh, thousand uh, uh, people, the police, uh, which are a very efficient unit now, there's 200,000 of them, and then the most important of all probably are the DRS, that's the Mukhabarat, the security uh, secret intelligence services which have access to the special forces of the army so in the security forces amongst that, that group I've named there you have at least 400,000 people as distinct from the army which is a uh, professional army about 120,000 so in a sense we need to look uh, very carefully at the security forces in general and there are divisions in amongst them or potential divisions the head of the DRS uh, General Mohamed Medien uh, has been the strong man in Algeria uh, and has controlled pretty well everything for the uh, he's been in charge of, of, of the, the these services now for nearly 20 years exactly 20 years 1990 uh, but he's been ill recently we don't know how, how, how ill but it appears possibly quite seriously uh, in November uh, there's a new head of the police force uh, he's only been in position since July he has performed extremely well in terms of controlling the police uh, over the last few days uh, in a very disciplined way a very militarized way so he is performing as a chief of police in a very st potentially the new strongman in Algeria okay so he needs to be watched Jeremy sorry to yeah. interrupt me let me jump in there last quick question to uh, Blake because we are coming to the end of the show I mean, where does this all leave Tunisia do you think there is the prospect of real political change there well, there's definitely the prospect, but um, you know, everyone I think in in Tunisia needs to be vigilant, and uh, I hope that there's, uh, and I want to say this carefully, that there's this continued threat of people taking to the streets if their rights aren't respected. Uh, I think the the uprising that took place, obviously, uh, was you know very violent and a lot of loss of life, which was terrible. But it wouldn't have happened without people risking their lives. And uh, unless there's that pressure on the government, um, I, you know, I don't think we can just trust these guys to do the right thing. So thanks to all my guests, Amin Ghali in Tunis, Jeremy Keenan in London and Blake Hounsell here in Doha. If you have any comments about today's program, do email us on insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.